Well, there was obviously a lot of pressure uh, on me when I was selected to be the first woman. I think that, that most of it was generated by the press. Uh, there were a lot of requests for interviews. Everyone wanted to talk to me, and basically I was trying to train and NASA was trying to get me trained. And I think that NASA did a very good job, especially before the flight, of shielding me from the press and allowing me to train for the, the job that, uh, that I was supposed to do. Um, right after the flight, of course, NASA wasn't there to shield me anymore, and uh, I, I just had a lot of attention focused on me. I knew during the flight that after the flight I was going to get a lot of attention, so I think that there was quite a bit of extra pressure on me. Sally Ride wasn't just an astronaut, she was a trailblazer, a scientist, and an advocate for young women everywhere. In this video, we'll walk through her life and her lasting legacy, and along the way, you'll hear Sally herself share her story in her own words. Sally Rye was born May the 26th, 1951 in Los Angeles, California. Her father, a political science professor, and her mother, a counselor, encouraged curiosity. Childhood was uh, probably the typical childhood for a kid growing up in Southern California in the 50s and early 60s. You know, I, I loved being outside. I loved um, being active. I you know, loved swimming. I loved playing tennis. I loved playing baseball in the street. Um, and uh, as it turns out, I also, also liked science and math. And I was probably fortunate in that, that both of my parents really valued education and they didn't have any sort of preconception on what, um, you know, what sort of field I should go into. So they made sure that I, that I spent plenty of time um, studying, but also trying to make it fun and trying to make it entertaining and trying to make me appreciate that it was a, a good way to get ahead in the world. In 1977, Sally spotted a small ad in a Stanford student newspaper. NASA was accepting women into astronaut training for the first time. I was literally just a couple of months away from getting, a, getting my Ph.D. in physics when I saw, believe it or not, an ad in the Stanford student newspaper that had been put in the newspaper by NASA saying that they were accepting applications for astronauts. And the moment I saw that, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, not that I wanted to leave physics. I loved it, um, but I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to apply to the astronaut corps and see whether, see whether NASA would take me and see whether I could, could uh, have the opportunity to go on that adventure. Among 8,000 applicants, only 35 were selected, six of them women. Sally was one of the few chosen, marking the beginning of a grueling journey through astronaut training. It was hard to become an astronaut. It was hard to make it through the selection process and the training itself was, uh, was very difficult. Um, not anywhere near as much physical training as people uh, imagine, but a lot of mental training, a lot of learning. Uh, you have to learn everything there is to know about the space shuttle and everything you're going to be doing and uh, everything you need to know if something goes wrong. And then once you've learned it all, you have to practice, 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 practice uh, until everything is, is uh, second nature. So it's, it's a very, very difficult training and, you know, it takes years. On June the 18th, 1983, history was made. Sally Ride boarded the Space Shuttle Challenger for mission STS-7, becoming the first American woman in space. The media attention was overwhelming. In orbit, she performed critical duties, operating the robotic arm to deploy satellites and conducting scientific experiments. Over six days, she orbited the Earth 97 times. When I was a little girl, I always dreamed of flying in space. And unbelievably, that dream came true. I can't explain why I wanted to do it. It's just something that was part of me. Then I had the chance to float over to the window and uh, look out down at the Earth below at the absolutely spectacular view. I could see coral reefs off the coast of Australia. I could see glaciers in the Himalayas. And the feeling of seeing your planet as a planet is just an amazing feeling. You can look at Earth's horizon and see this really, really thin royal blue line. And then you realize that it's Earth's atmosphere and that that's all there is of it. And it's about as thick as the fuzz on a tennis ball. 
It's a totally different perspective. And it makes you appreciate how fragile our existence is. Her second flight in 1984 further solidified her legacy. Although plans for a third mission were halted after the Challenger disaster in 86, Sally later served on both the Challenger and Columbia investigation boards. She's the only astronaut to serve on both. Four of the astronauts who were killed in the Challenger explosion were part of our group of 35 uh, astronauts, part of that astronaut class. So these were people that at that time I'd known uh, for eight years. I'd worked with them every day. I'd um, you know, gone to dinner at their houses. I knew their families. Um, so they were very, very close, close friends. My then husband had been on the flight before the Challenger accident, and I was scheduled to go about two months after the Challenger accident. So it was, you know, it, it uh, hit me very, very personally um, just to lose friends and to think about, you know, what might have been. And of course, it was also, it was a huge blow professionally because, um, you know, I think that uh, astronauts understand very well what the, the risks are of flying, flying in space. Um, but uh, we all also have a real uh, trust and faith in NASA and the process that it goes through to minimize those risks to the extent possible. And as the investigation unfolded, it became very clear that that system had, had broken down and that, that system that we, that we trusted um, to you know, track down any, um, any flaw or any piece of bad test data uh, really had failed. Sally left NASA in 87, but continued to make profound impacts. She became a physics professor at UC San Diego, inspiring countless students with her expertise and humility. In 2001, she founded the Sally Ride Science, dedicated to encouraging young people, especially girls, to pursue STEM careers. So I, I decided that um, you know, it was worth my time to, to try to um, have some impact on that and try to uh, first help change the culture and make the culture realize that the girls are out there, um, that, uh, uh, that if we want scientists and engineers in the future, we should be um, cultivating the girls as much as the boys, and that we needed to be, be able to give uh, girls in middle school, high school, and college the same opportunities that we give to boys. So, um, you know, I've, I've put in a lot of time creating programs for girls, particularly in in middle school to just keep them engaged and uh, uh, introduce them to role models, show them that, that uh, whether they want to be a rocket scientist or a, a geochemist or a microbiologist, that there are women who are now actively involved in those careers and who love what they do. Sadly, in 2011, Sally was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. She fought it bravely for 17 months, continuing her education until her passing on July the 23rd of 2012 at the young age of 61.